Hi everyone, thanks for watching part one and welcome to part two of How to Paint the Cherry Blossom in Watercolor by Ross Barbera. The first washes of color are dry. Now I can start to work in the detail. So what I do is I dampen the petal. Redampening the petal will not disturb the previously applied watercolor wash, but redampening enables me to apply a new wash of color on top of the dry area without leaving brush marks. In this situation, I'm using the mixed gray to adjust the tone of the underneath color. And I'll paint in areas that I see are in the shadow. And that curves over. As the petal moves towards the center, it picks up a little bit more violet down there and a little bit of cobalt blue there. First, I'll work in the blue. And I let it bleed. Then I'll work in some of that violet color. Very subtle. It grays towards the tip as the petal curves. But as I see subtle hints of other colors, and I see a little bit more of the reddish tint down here, I'll work those tones in. I'm adding some neutral tint to suggest the shade in that area. The green form over here has a strong area of demarcation right here. It's much deeper green here than down here. I'd like to add that to what we have here. You watch me wash in the area. Now I'm going to start to distinguish the top from the bottom. That's about where I want it to be, fairly dark. Often, if I want to make a green, a mixed green, more earthy, I add a touch of raw sienna to it, or brown matter. Place it on my mixing part of the palette, and I'm going to add it to the green. See that? That is a beautiful, natural green. Now I'll wash in my green. I dampened it. This will allow the watercolor to blend in a controlled way. I could have dampened the entire area. For some reason, I thought this would be a better approach. After washes of color have completely dried, I redampened the area with clean water. Then introduce additional washes of color to establish transitions to darker shades. I always rotate my watercolor when I feel my painting position is uncomfortable. And it's time to do something with these. I'll begin with my first wash, and that will be the lightest color that I see. And it's a mixed green of ultramarine blue. Windsor yellow, and a very light touch of burnt sienna. Into that, I'm going to add the darker green. I added more ultramarine blue to the mixed green to make it darker. I'm still painting with the same mixed green, but I'm varying the amount of French ultramarine blue and burnt sienna that I add to that green to create different shades of the green. Now 
more golden green down here. So I'm working it into my wet area. And then I dampen my brush and I pull it up. I'll carry this lighter value green to the tip and to relate it to what I have going on over here I'm going to add a touch of beautiful burnt sienna there's a little hint of burnt sienna up there and then maybe a little additional water push it around this form goes through a transition from green to burnt sienna. I'll lay in the burnt sienna wash. And now I'll flow in the mixed green. Now I explore the surface and any little shadows or hints of color variations that I see. I work in. First, I dampen the area with clean water. Then apply my color. In this case, I'm going to add a little bit of cobalt blue with quinacridone red. I want to suggest a little bit of a shade over there. I have a bit of a stem that comes down there. There's a fairly strong burnt sienna tint that seems to be underneath that green. So I'm going to take a little burnt sienna, lay it in, distilled water. Now I wash in my green. Into this area I'm applying neutral tint as a shadow color. And I'm pulling the color up into the bud with plain water. But for the shadow on this one, instead of using the neutral tint, I'm going to add some cobalt blue. I dampened it because I really want that to bleed gradually. I've reached a stage in the development of this watercolor where it really is time to lay in the background. Looking at the background in the photo, the original photo that I took of the cherry blossoms, it's basically a gray background with some hints of blue, a darker form over here, and some hints of green. Now the first thing that I do before I lay in the background is prepare my colors. I don't want to be struggling for colors as I'm doing the wash. I'm going to go with a neutral tint. I'll make sure I have a variety of blues. Here we have our French ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, Antwerp blue, Quinacridone Rose Red. Brown matter, definitely. And some of my mixed greens. I like to get a magenta into the mix. See why I use bins? They're wonderful. Burnt Sienna. Cobalt Blue. And I need to replenish that. The next thing that I do in preparation for the wash is dampen the background. So using my flat angle brush, which is a wonderful brush to work with, you can do a flat wash with a flat angle brush and still be able to get into tight areas with the tip of the angle. The advantage of stretching the paper is it lays completely flat when wetting large areas. I advise you to stretch your watercolor paper.
beginning with my neutral tint. I see a dark area in this section of the photo. The tip of the brush, because it's on an angle, allows me to get up right against the flower. When I lay in the background, although I am referring to my photo, my approach is very abstract. And I often base my color decisions not on whether or not that's exactly what's happening in the photo, but do I think that color works in the specific area that I'm applying it in the background in relationship to how it interacts with the foreground flower. I always work wet into wet in an effort to encourage the free intermingling of fluid colors. I have my table situated so I can walk around this as I paint it. I want to be able to access the image from all sides. like to get a little burnt sienna in under there. I do see a hint to the brown. The colors need to freely flow into one another and mix on their own. I also don't want it to dry out and create brush marks like it began to do right over there. So I quickly wet it. I'm looking more at my watercolor than at the actual photo. I'm approaching it at this point as an abstract painting. Carry a little of that magenta through to the other side. I'd like to continue with some of these greens down here that I do see in the photo. They're subtle and they're they're totally out of focus, whatever they are. I assume they're leaves. A hint of the neutral tint. There we go. Dampen it so it bleeds. The basic cobalt blue, I think, is an important color in this painting. Hmm. There is a branch totally out of focus back there. And I'll also get a little gray in there. The reason why I'm putting gray there, it has to do with the continuity of the background. If you have a background, a background is a background. Think of it as a separate layer from the foreground. And it wouldn't be logical for the color not to continue a little beyond the bud. I'm getting the feeling that that is so dark there there would be a little bit of extended beyond the bud. To have it end at that point bothers my eye. It's been a few hours since I laid in the background, and now it's completely dry. So I'm ready to sail into the final thing that remains to be done, and that is the branch. In my photo, the branch is completely out of focus, and that's okay. I don't mind the blurriness of it, because I'm not going to get into a highly detailed rendering of the branch. But I did want to have better color reference than the photos providing. So I went outside and I cut myself a little bit of the branch. If you notice, since I'm comparing the color of the green against what's in the painting, you see how this is a very natural green? The mixture of French ultramarine blue and aureolan yellow produced a wonderfully natural green. And to work in the browns, 
and the dark shades of the stem, I'll be referring to this. Actually, what my photo didn't capture, and now that I'm looking at this closely, something I like are these little details. So I think I'm going to draw them in. At least some of them. I'm going to work in the brown matter. There. There. Mmm, strong color. Powerful. Red brown. And there. I added a few of these throughout the whole branch, and now I'm just about ready to lay in the branch. I'll dampen the section that I intend to paint. I start painting the branch by washing in a dark mixed gray. And the area that I'm applying the gray to has been pre-dampened. It's incredible. The, the dark, I mean, that, that's black. You can achieve by mixing brown matter and Antwerp blue. I want to lighten a bit as we go up to the top. It's important that this first application of dark gray does not dry before I have a chance to add some brown matter into it. Okay, I got to get some of that brown matter in here. Also, I see it throughout here. The photo is helping me to simplify, and the actual branch has given me better information as to color choice. I'm also adding some cerulean blue that I see in the branch into the gray area. I decided the best procedure would be to mask all of these little surface details out before I lay in the color for my stem. Because I've had the masking material on for an unusually long length of time, I'm going to take it off now. In this area, not over here where I just applied it. Definitely want to remove it from here. I don't recommend keeping masking material on for more than a day or two at the most. This has been on way longer than that, and that makes me a bit nervous. How do I remove it? Well, there's a couple ways. Your hands are absolutely clean. Sometimes I just begin to rub into it and work it off that way. You can also use a rubber cement pickup, or I often just use a kneaded eraser and rub. Yes, I left it on way too long. It's a little gummy, but I will be able to get it off with lots of rubbing. So two rules. One, don't leave it on for more than a couple of days at the most. Two, use relatively new drawing gum. If it gets to be a few years old, throw it out and buy a new bottle. It's not worth the risk of ruining a piece. Using the mixture of Antwerp blue and brown matter, I wet some paint. Using the angled brush for this, because I need quite a bit of paint. The number six round would just be too tiny for this area. Good. Although, I want to safely pull it down to here. And the number six round is perfect for that.
Actually, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna give the entire thing a coat of the mixed gray. And when it comes to getting close to things like the bud, this is where I use my number six. I see a strong hint of brown matter. I always rely on the property of watercolor to do its own thing. And although I direct it, ultimately I accept the accidents. If you're going to be successful with your watercolors, you must learn to accept the accidents and allow water color to do its own thing. Now I'm flowing French ultramarine blue into the gray and brown matter that's still very wet. See, that's the beauty of masking. I don't have to worry about stopping and starting. I could just flow it over the masked area. Good. All of this area is dry and the masking material has been on for about a day and it's time to remove it. So using my soft heated eraser, I'll rub into it. To complete the watercolor, I'm going to work around the surface to establish highlights using the incredible nib. In my photo I see a, a highlight along this area. This is a soft focus highlight. So I'll dampen the area. Then I wet the tip of my nib. And I don't use a lot of pressure. I just gently work into that surface. The action of the nib actually removes a little bit of the paper. Sometimes I'll use the chisel end of the nib. To get a nice sharp line. And I don't attempt to create the highlight, and it's a subtle highlight here, in one stroke. I'll rub lightly across multiple times, blotting up with my tissue to see what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm pleased with that. That's exactly what I want. It's subtle, but it's there. I also notice a little bit of a highlight right along the back side. So I dampen it, and I work the edge of my nib into the area that I want to see the highlight. And I blot up with the tissue. Now along this bud, I have a much sharper little highlight. For that, I'll use an X-Acto knife. With the point of my X-Acto knife, very carefully scratching the highlight that I see. Exacto knife is very useful for creating sharp highlights. The highlights are the very last thing I do. And the reason why it's the last thing I do is using an X-Acto knife or the incredible nib to work in a highlight changes surface texture of the paper. And if you were to wash color over that area that you scratched into, it would affect how the paint is absorbed into the paper and um, could create problems. This little thing has some nice sharp little highlights that I'm just noticing. And the contrast, contrast is wonderful in watercolor. Here we have the opportunity to establish contrasts of light and dark. Light being a little 
little glistens of highlight on the edge of this, whatever this is, little brown thing. It's the edges that have the sharpest highlights. And the exacto knife is perfect for bringing that out. To remove the paper from the board, I'm going to cut the watercolor just beyond the staples, on this side of the staples, all around the piece. Why do I do that? Because by doing that, I'm cutting into the part that's not glued down, it's simply stapled down. The butcher block tape from about here over has been glued to the board. So it's important to cut the paper where it's not glued to the board, and that's about it, right there. These are my exacto. Yeah. At this point, I'm not worried about it being square. Just want to cut it slightly beyond the staples. Now, I'm going to start to pull out the staples. I use very shallow staples to secure my paper to the board. No need to use large staples. I can simply pull it up then along that cut line. Of course, if you mount the watercolor with a mat, you don't need the deckled edges. But since I float my watercolors in the frame and expose the edges, I like the look of the deckled edges. Very careful operation. You don't want to tear your watercolor painting. Okay, see it comes up easily if you, if you pull the staples out. When floating a watercolor painting above the mat, deckled edges look much better than cut edges. Good. Having removed the, the tape that was actually glued to the board, I sand it. Having sanded it, I recoat the board with polycrylic varnish. That seals any exposed homosote, makes it waterproof. Okay, I'll put this on the side to dry. Some examples of my paintings with deckled edges that are a result of the way I tear it after having removed the painting from the board. I'm using a heavy T-square for this. It gives me a firm edge that you need. I position the ruler against the edge of the butcher block tape. Press firmly, and I tear. And it's this tearing action, you can see it happening, that creates that nice deckled look. Okay? There we go. Making sure that I'm just fractionally beyond the tape. Press. A lot of pressure. The cherry blossom watercolor painting is finished. I had lots of fun painting this little painting. Hope you enjoy watching the video.